Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic D Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and you can also visit our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today's show is sponsored by coronatools.com, the nation's leader in garden and landscaping tools. Listeners of The Organic View can receive 20% off their coronatools.com purchase by using the coupon code ORGVIEW. That's O-R-G-V-I-E-W. For more promotional offers, please visit our website at www.theorganicview.com. And don't forget to check out our contest section. On today's show, Tom and I are going to talk about why people should not become a beekeeper and what they should do in order to help honeybees as well as other pollinators. So I'd like to welcome to the show my co-host, Colorado beekeeper, Mr. Tom Theobald. Good afternoon, Tom. Good afternoon, June. You've been teaching classes for novice beekeepers for quite some time. Can you explain what are some of the key issues that you focus on as an instructor? Well, you know, it would take a couple hours to cover most of what we we do. We started the beekeeping class, of which I'm one of the instructors. Uh, I believe it was 1998. We first began to see serious bee losses in 1995 when the parasitic mites, the varroa mites, showed up in Boulder County. They'd been discovered... In Florida in 1987, took them a little while to move across the country. I first identified them here in 1995, and we saw a precipitous drop in both the colonies and the number of beekeepers. And in 1998, we began an eight-week beekeeping class to give beekeepers a good foundation in how to be a beekeeper. And we covered all the basics about hive management and the life cycle of the bees and some of the problems they were likely to confront and what the flow of the season was. And so we've been doing that now for 19 years, and I've been a part of creating this cadre of new beekeepers. Initially, we thought that uh, our losses were primarily due to the varroa mites. Looking back, I question whether that was the only reason for our losses because as we've gotten into the issue of the neonicotinoid pesticides we've learned that the first of those imidacloprid was introduced in 1994 and looking back I think what was happening was we were seeing not so much the losses from the mites but the early losses from the neonicotinoid pesticides we didn't know it at the time it's it's a little clearer now What's happened in the last 10 years is we've seen a tremendous upsurge in the number of people who want to try to help solve these problems and and believe that they can contribute by becoming new beekeepers. And Tom, you know, a lot of people do push that. You see it on numerous websites where I don't know if these websites actually understand the gravity of the impact of neonicotinoids, but one of the solutions that they keep pushing is, oh, if you want to help the bees, become a beekeeper. And my argument has always been, no, that's the last thing that you want to do. If anything, do something to actually help the existing commercial beekeepers, as well as do something as far as the environment is concerned and do your part and not use products that contain neonicotinoid pesticides. Well, I think the response on... uh many of the people in the public has been to help by becoming a beekeeper, but I don't think they really understand what's involved. And I joke with the class each year. I say that you don't keep bees, you marry them. And having a colony of bees in some ways is like having a child. It requires regular attention and you have to help them along and you have to understand where your help is necessary and where it isn't. It's far more involved than hanging a birdhouse in a tree or putting out a bird bath or something like that. But from that group of people have come some of the new beekeepers of today, and their presence does help to provide pollination. My concern is that I think we've reached the saturation point. And in some areas, let me put it this way. 
bees are livestock, and just as you can overstock a pasture with cattle, you can overstock a pasture with bees. You can have too many honeybees, and that may seem strange for me to be saying that at a time when we're losing so many, but the carrying capacity of an area is limited, and one of the concerns that's been voiced more recently is the lack of forage. If we were having, for example, we were having a, a forage problem with cattle, would the answer be to put even more cattle out in the pasture? Uh, that simply isn't the case. What I want to suggest is that we still see a lot of people who are very concerned, and I think the concern is growing, and I think rightly so. But I think their best efforts would be invested in not becoming a beekeeper, but rather take that same time and educate themselves as to what the problems are and begin to speak out and become more politically active. Because at the heart of it, these are political questions. We've been failed by our regulatory system uh, and, and our U.S. Department of Agriculture, and that's the main reason why we're losing so many bees. There's been no protection, and... The only thing that is going to change that is citizen involvement. Congress has done nothing. The EPA is working against the pollinators. The USDA is questionable. There are a lot of good people at the EPA and the USDA, but the management level has been corrupted by the chemical industry, and, and they work against the interests of the pollinators. The people who are concerned and remain concerned, I think, would better serve the issue by becoming educated and involved and politically active rather than try to be beekeepers. So, Tom, let me ask you, where exactly do these novice beekeepers fit in? We have a good example here in Boulder County. We're just north of Denver along the front range of the Rockies, and were it not for the new beekeepers, we probably would have areas in the county that were very short of pollinators. So my friend Miles McGahey and I have gone each year over the past 10 years to California to bring back to Colorado what are called packages. This would be the start for a new colony. And this is to replace the colonies that have been lost over the winter or colonies that are intended to get new beekeepers started. What's happened is something that has always for millions of years been a perennial. A colony of bees would survive for years and years and years and replicate itself. We've seen the bees move from being a perennial to being an annual. And by that I mean that we have so many that are dying each year that there's a constant replacement that's necessary. So the several hundred packages that we bring back to Colorado will go in in many cases to new beekeepers and those beekeepers will keep those bees alive through the course of the summer and because they're alive they are out there pollinating but their longevity is is very uncertain and they're likely to die within a year or two even under the best of conditions. Even the experienced beekeepers are having great difficulty keeping the bees alive. But the colonies, the packages that we bring back for, from California will, in the hands of hobbyists and newcomers, pollinate several hundred thousand acres here in Boulder County. So there's a positive to that. Without those beekeepers, we wouldn't have them managing those bees, and we would be very short of pollinators. But... My point is, I don't believe we need any new beekeepers. I wouldn't discourage anyone who is really motivated to do it. And in fact, I've been a part of educating those very people. But I think we have a sufficient number of new beekeepers. What we need are new political activists. The people have to speak out if this is going to change. We're... We're in the middle of a massive environmental disaster, and we need the help of people, not necessarily as beekeepers, but as political activists. 
So how do you propose that they become political activists, especially since many of these people, and we see this with the GMO activists, a lot of GMO activists don't even understand why GMOs are a threat. They understand some of the more common points, but they don't really understand the science. And it's baffling. I mean, how can you how can you defend something when you don't have the proper information? Well, that's that's part of the challenge, and they have to take the responsibility to ferret out that information. And it's out there, and there are groups that are speaking out. There are NGOs that are speaking out. There's a vast amount of information on the Internet on both the efforts to control these chemicals and the science related to their consequences. That's the homework that needs to be done. And we need more people who are doing that, who are doing the digging, who are educating themselves, who are speaking out, who are contacting their representatives. They have to take the initiative. They can't wait to be spoon-fed Uh, a recipe for what they should be doing. They need to get on the Internet, they need to start educating themselves, and they need to become active. There are two things that have happened here in Colorado just within the last couple of weeks that uh, bear on this question. The first was the passage of a resolution at the state level uh, declaring I-76, Interstate Highway 76, which runs from Denver northeast toward the Nebraska line. The resolution declares it as a pollinator protection corridor. The second thing happened just last night, and this is a resolution that was presented to the Longmont City Council, and Longmont is about four miles from where I live, uh, presented to the Longmont City Council a pollinator protection resolution created and promoted by the Longmont Coalition of People and Pollinators. They were the primary moving force behind that. And it specifies a number of things that the city will or won't do to protect the pollinators, to promote habitat, to increase the habitat, to change, for example, mowing practices on some of the city-owned land, and that passed unanimously last night before the city council. Now, both of those just opened the door for further discussion of just how they should take place, and there are some serious questions involved, one of which is what the level of environmental poisoning may be in the habitat that's being proposed, but these come as a result of the efforts of many of these new people that that we're talking about. Many of the new beekeepers have become involved, and it's this kind of activism that we need much more of. Thank you, Tom. Well, this has been a very interesting topic, and I guarantee you nobody else is talking about this because people are so quick to do the exact opposite. So, Tom, thanks for your time today. I know that I'm anticipating a lot of feedback, especially about this topic. Once again, the bottom line comes down to education, educating each other, educating our neighbors, educating people that we come in contact with and letting them know what's going on. Because without that education, how can we even have the activists that you had suggested or even bring about change with the EPA or any of these things? Tom, thanks again for joining me today. Well, thank you, June, and I would just like to thank the listeners again, and and I want to make the point that feedback is important to us because that's how we can judge whether anybody is listening or not, and that's been that's been some of the the focus of this program today is the feedback. We need more people involved. We need more people speaking out, and and I thank those people who are listening, and I thank you for providing us with a a, a podium to speak. Thanks, June. Thanks, Tom. And folks, if you do have any questions, please reach out to us. The email address is questions at theorganicview.com. Before I go, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge some of our supporters of the show, including Connie Earhart from It Works, Corona Tools, Wodasai Sump Pump Control Systems, and NovenaPrayer.com. Thank you for tuning in. Tune in next week as Tom and I continue the discussion.